The lecture is called Hungry for Change and it is the effects of the Great Irish Famine on migration patterns, basically. Because people tend to think sometimes that everybody stayed at home until the famine and then everybody left. And it didn't quite work out like that. So, um, I think this quote sums it up. Ireland under the Union was a land that most people wanted to leave. And they're talking about the, the Union of Ireland with the rest of Great Britain in 1801. And if you look at the stats, you might think that that is true because between 1801 and 1900, approximately 8 million people left Ireland. And the majority went to England, the United States and Canada. And I should point out that in the early 1800s, the population of America didn't quite reach 8 million. So that's an awful lot of people just from one small island to go to America. So how do we know that there's that many people went when, to be truthful, the records of migration are not that good? You'll find passenger lists, but passenger lists are unreliable and not very useful, although we have them. There's too many oddly quirks about them and they're not complete either. So how do we know the people went? Well basically we're doing it on a uh, calculated educated guesswork basically. If we look at the statistics of the Irish population between 1801 and 1841 you'll find that every 10 years through the decades the natural increase was run at about 8% of the population. So the natural increase is taken by the number of live births minus the number of deaths plus normal migration patterns and that will get you what this increase usually is. Um, if we use that to calculate what the population should be, then if you look at this based on an 8% growth rate, which is quite um, average because as the population grows bigger sometimes those stats change and it actually does get bigger. So this is quite a conservative estimate, although having said that, you will find ac academics arguing over these figures, but then again they'd argue over how many angels can fit in the pen, so that's academics for you. So I'm using these statistics which is calculated on an 8% increase. Now from 1822, which is the first census of Ireland, which again is not that reliable but a fairly good indicator, up to 41 you can see it grow growing steadily. And if we continue that increase on, we're going from just over 6, maybe 7 million people. By 1901, it reaches about close to 13 million. Okay, so that's quite a high percentage and quite a lot for a small island to support. However, if we look at what happened after the famine, you see that it continues up to the 8 and then falls away. And what it also continues to do every decade is keep falling, um, which is unusual. I'd like to point out that after a catastrophe such as war or famine or something of that nature, epidemic disease and so on, you usually find there'll be a dip in population but then it will rise again and very soon come back to what it was pre-disaster. Pre this was unusual in Ireland in that it didn't, it continued to dip and it continued to dip right into the 19th century, 20th century, sorry, I think it was about 1950, 1960, before the population actually reached pre-famine levels. So uh, for those of you who like actual figures instead of graphs, I'm happy with graphs myself, I think they're quick and easy, but you can see the actual figures calculated on this 21, 23, uh, sorry, 21, 31, 41 are actual statistics from the census as of uh, 51. These are for the, the actual figures, for all <coughs> census figures. The estimated growth is in the middle as to what the figures should have been. So as you can see, they part company at 41. Now, obviously, the big event that happened after 41 was the Great Irish Famine. Um, I'm going to give this a go because I always find it difficult to pronounce it, but Thytopa Thora Infestans was the blight. <laughs> okay, that's the technical name of it, which I will never use again. Okay. Um, partly uh, came from America, as did the original potato, and hit the Isle of Wight on the 31st of August, 
and then made its first appearance in Ireland in the middle of September 1845. Now, it caused a pretty much general failure of the potato crop, although not wholesale. Um, the next year, though, there were fewer seed potatoes to plant, which led to 47 when it hit again, it was 47 was complete failure, practically no, no potatoes at all. And 48 they recovered a bit. So, you know, it wasn't one of the reasons for this being so bad was because it was several years in a row. It wasn't just a one off which people had been used to before. And if you look at the records, you will see any number of famines and shortages periods happening in Ireland, but quite often they were localised. I mean, the last Great Hunger was in the 1740s, so it's been 100 years since there's been a Great Famine, but there had been other smaller ones in between, and people had managed to get through it. This lasted more than they expected, more than anyone expected, and therefore was all the worse for it. <coughs> so, as I say, first reported on the 13th of September, it did begin to fail over Ireland. Um, first occurrence, it was a new disease, and it was ex uh, made worse by the very cold, wet summer of the year, which didn't help anyway. Uh, the blight made the potatoes rotten and inedible and, to be truthful, quite smelly as well. You could actually smell the rotten potatoes as you walk past the fields. Uh, they're said that you could pick up a sound one and it would rot in your hand. You know, it was really that quick and fast acting. And I say there wasn't enough seed potatoes to use the Irish the following year. So the potato crop failure was one of the contributors to the Great Irish Famine. But I'd like to point out, I'm not going to go into detail here, but the failure of the potato crop was only one problem that caused the Great Irish Famine. Now when we look at the migration figures as well, putting them also with the famine, you can see that there was migration beforehand, 1821 to 30, it was run at about 50,000. Uh, going up to about 200,000 in the 1830s to 40s, and then it shoots up over 800,000 in the 40s, 41 to 50, and even higher the following decade, before going down a wee bit more, and then going up again in the 1880s when there was a great agricultural depression as well. And this is Irish figures to the United States. Now that doesn't take into effect the uh, uh, the migration to England or Scotland or to Australia or Canada, you know, it was just to America, that's the figure I'm showing here, but you can see it's quite a lot. So, who was leaving and why were they leaving? Well, I'm going to check out a couple of, again, I'd like to emphasise these are general trends and you will find exceptions to every rule that I'm going to talk about. So I uh, just want you to bear that in mind before you say, no, that's not true. But I'm going to look at five categories of society in 19th century Ireland, okay? And, and first of all, I'm starting off with the aristocracy. And for those of you who don't know what the aristocracy is, there's a lovely picture of them, including, the, I think it's Prince George at the time. Okay. So um, I got uh, the Londonderries outside Mount Stewart, for those of you who are interested. And we do hold the Londonderry papers. We have now since bought them wonderful collection for a lot of different avenues of research. Various other members of the aristocracy, obviously we had a lot of them. And I'd like to say that as far as I can see, the Great Irish Famine did not affect the aristocracy that much. To be truthful, most of those who wanted to leave had already left after 1801 with, with the Act of Union. The Act of Union had gathered, you know, um, John Foster, for example, was the last speaker of the Irish House of Commons. It had amalgamated with Britain, so therefore the seat of power was London. A lot of people who were politicians, MPs, you know, career politicians, diplomats and so on, these were the landed gentry. So they would move over to London to be at the seat of power. They would take their families with them and they would leave their lands in the hands of an agent. Um, as a social scene in London was better than the social scene in Dublin or Belfast, they tended to stay there most of the time, only visiting maybe while Parliament was in recess. So they grew up a great Irish aristocracy who loaned lots of land in Ireland but never visited. But the other thing about absentee landlords, I don't want to paint everybody as I say with the same black brush, but 
A lot of people owned land in England and owned lands in Ireland. And even in Ireland, they would hold lands in maybe Wicklow and Fermanagh. You know, so you can't actually be in every place at once. So yes, there were going to be absentee landlords for various different reasons. Now, I'm going to concentrate on the worst case scenario, obviously, because that's what most people like to hear about. But as far as the aristocracy were concerned, they were happy enough living in London or other parts of England and their estates there. And as long as the rent money was coming in, they didn't really much care. You know, they appointed agents. Some of the agents were better than others. I mean, Lord Mazarin, if you look at his papers, again, which are held here, you get very, very detailed reports from his land agents about what was going on, and you know, even down to planting trees in certain parts to try and improve drainage. So he was kept very well informed about what was happening. Others didn't care. As long as the rents were coming in, that was it. So basically, most of them had moved. By the time the Great Irish Famine hit, they weren't there, they weren't seeing what was happening, and it wasn't really affecting them because they had a pyramid system going on most. They let out their land agent, but they also let out the strong farmers. Farmers who would hold maybe 50, 100, 200 acres. The strong farmers would in turn let it out to smaller farmers, who in turn would let it out to even smaller until you get down to the cottier class. The poor people was affected, and they didn't pay the rent. But the larger families still had to pay their rent, so they were still getting it. So really, for most people, there was very little effect on them. In fact, it might have helped that in some ways, because with a lot of the smaller farmers and labourers leaving the land, the strong farmers were able to entrench, which made that their, found their properties worth more. So their rents were put up, so the landlords were getting even more money. And to be truthful, quite a few of them did use that money to help some of their, uh, their labourers and people that rented land from them, to their tenants basically, uh, to actually migrate. And there are quite good things for that. Now, I just mentioned these two. John Foster is, say, last speaker of the Irish House of Commons. And there's Sir William Gregory of Cool, County Fermanagh, who was the MP for Dublin. And uh, he introduced an act that later became known as the Gregory Clause, and I'm going to speak about that a wee bit further. But I just <coughs> want to read you a, a letter from uh, one of uh, the London Dairy um, agents. Sorry. This is an extract from a report by John Langtree, agent on the Marcus of Donegal's estate in County Antrim, and it was sent to Lady Dufferin in 1848, Hide in the Famine. And he's talking about how uh, some of the landlords had helped their tenants to move. And he says, generally speaking, these thinnings were for the good. And he's using the agricultural term there, you know, where you would thin trees to allow greater growth for bigger trees. But he's using the plan of two of the tenants. He said, they enlarged some farms and in the hands of better labourers than the immigrants had been. And if many more should go away, of which there is prospect, it would be all the better for the estate. For without the data crop, it is quite impossible for small farmers to live and pay rent, especially on poor soils. So basically, you can see that the, even the agents were thinking that the poorer farmers getting away from the land was a good thing, but it wasn't really affecting the aristocracy. In fact, the rich just got richer. Wow, isn't that amazing? So that was um, the aristocracy, I say, happy enough. Now, Underneath them, as I pointed out, the pyramid system, you get the strong farmers. Now, this is a picture of the farm at Century Hill in Carmony. Again, we have the records of this here. A strong farmer would have either owned or more probably leased his land. But it would have been a good acreage, plenty of room to develop, probably mixed farm and a bit of weaving as well. These were usually family run. And the strong farmers, Again, I hate to bring religion into this, but I will anyway. Mainly Presbyterian or Protestant of some denomination. And they tended to practice primogeniture, which meant that everything went to the eldest son. Okay, so you'd, the father died, the widow might have taken over, but it definitely went to the eldest son and they worked the land. Which meant that the younger sons were left looking for somewhere to go or something to do. And while some of them would have gone into the church, increasing secularization, at this period, 
tended to go other options and obviously uh, the new world lovely open up lots of nice opportunities so a lot of the younger sons of these drama farmers would have actually gone to try and find their way in a new world and normally these people would have paid their own fare they might have had connections but they definitely they went under their own steam and they went to build a new life you know probably a new farm for their own um, now after the famine this sort of immigration did decrease slightly and again there's no as far as I can say there's no real definitive evidence for it as far as I can find that's not to say it doesn't exist but it seemed that after the famine there were fewer labourers so labouring costs and labouring wages would rise so rather than employ labourers the fathers kept their sons at home longer to help on the farm they also um, if they were staying at home with less prospect of a farm of their own the sons of the stronger farmers weren't they were putting off marriage because they weren't going to get married and still live at home sort of thing and that actually added to the rise in the age of marriage of which i'll say later either um, so for strong farmers again the famine didn't really affect them too much in fact and sometimes it did consolidate their uh, their situation because instead of leasing land to poorer farmers or to smaller farmers or to cottiers, they consolidated bought land that maybe were vacant and so sort of those who survived actually did do quite well. Um, and obviously I'm saying these are general trends, I'm sure there were some that went blow all as well, but you know, as I say general trends, the strong farmers did okay. Now another group that's often un overlooked are tradesmen. Again, tradesmen always on the lookout for new markets and new opportunities, so they are quick to take advantage of anything that offers itself. And the opening up of the Americas, Canada and so on, even Australia, all of this added to, uh, they saw them as new markets, so they jumped on board and they were looking for things. Even they actually uh, worked almost as immigration agents where they would go somewhere and employ somewhere someone from home who they could trust to look after their interest so there'd be short-term migration perhaps while they set up a business then they'd maybe go back home employ a few people bring them back with them and let them run it so there was a lot of that going on and um, i mean if you think of the number of plantations that irish people were involved in and that was for tobacco, for cotton, etc. And for the various markets, like the Richardsons, for example, were actually exporting to Peru uh, in, during the 19th century. So I think that was quite wonderful. But they had to have agents there, so they were actually helping people to migrate. Now, um, one of the other things about this, although most of these uh, tradesmen were quite prosperous and well-to-do, they were not aristocracy. And quite a few were also Catholics, and that was as a result of the penal laws not allowing Catholics to hold a pro certain professions or get a job in the civil service and so on. So many of them went into either being a lawyer or a doctor or went into trade. So that was uh, there. Um, to be truthful, again, tradespeople, it depended on their trade again. But quite often they weren't that badly affected because as people left the countryside, so labourers, cottagers left the countryside, came into towns, it meant competition was for jobs was quite strong. So wages were depressed, so they could employ people a lot cheaper. But because there was scarce disease and certain things, that pushed all prices up. So they were making more profits because they were buying low, selling high and doing okay, thank you very much. Um, and basically the tradespeople, their migration patterns didn't really vary. They migrated before the famine, they migrated after the famine, but they went under their own steam. It was for business reasons, they paid for other people to go, again, all for business reasons. Oops, hang on. I'm behind in my... And of course one of the things about these people, when they were doing well, they were sending letters and photographs back home to say about how well they were doing. 
And that was encouraging other people to think of migration. So that would uh, encourage other people to go as well. So now we come to labourers. Now, labourers, be before the famine, usually went if someone asked them to. You know, if they were invited to long, if they knew somebody else. It was a trend, they would go, but for the most part, they were neither for or against it. In fact, as very few of them had actual ties to the land, most of them moved from farm to farm, or stayed on a farm for a few years, moved on, depending on the prospects. They, they were also quite migratory, migratory, yeah, sorry, I can't even pronounce that when I say it. But, you know, they would go in search of the work, so they weren't afraid of getting on their bike and going looking for work, so maybe even going over to England if they need to. So they were used to going and coming and not staying. Again, they usually saved for their own fare or would take advantage of the government schemes. <laughs> and there were quite a lot of government schemes advertising, you know, um, work for labourers in Canada, work for labourers in, you know, good strong labourers wanted to, you know, for the frontier and so on. And in fact, you will find many people lied and said they were a labourer to take advantage of it. As well as that, they were also looking for domestic servants, the females. And the females, unusually, and again in Ireland, it was single females who went. Normally in any other country, women go as part of a family group. But in Ireland, females were going singly as well. So as I say, they usually took advantage of the government schemes, went out, and maybe when they were there, settled, got a job, got a few bob, they would send money back and bring the other members of their family with them. So it's called chain migration. One, one goes first, gets another over, they would sell, you know, and you could finally end up with whole families, in fact, even in one case, whole communities transplanted to the Americas. Now, when the famine hit, obviously, for various reasons, there was less work for some of the labourers, which meant that there was more competition for jobs, which meant that wages were depressed again, which again meant there was an incentive for them to go looking for work, and they would go. Also, and many of them drifted to the towns, and the towns again were very, um, very hostile to workers, not only, you know, trade unions, which are quite legend at times, sort of didn't want migrant workers, but they also, um, the disease was more rampant, the houses were bad, you know, the situation, the sanitation, everything like that was unhealthy. So you find a lot of labourers who moved to the town actually died of um, disease rather than um, the famine. But they were famine fever, the colic, the cholera, Asiatic cholera had hit in the 30s. So again, there was all different things that helped. And these people are the ones who got hit mainly by disease and again they did want to migrate but later after the famine again although there was plenty of government schemes when you got to the 1860s when they got to America they found there was a lot of competition freed slaves and Irish labourers were fighting for the same jobs and in some cases in some communities it was along the lines of I would not hire a white domestic servant it wouldn't do for a white person to be in the position of a domestic, not when we have black slaves. So they were competing for this position. So, however, you find that a lot of them, despite the fact that, they, you know, wages were okay in the country after the famine, but they wanted land of their own, they wanted a new start, and very, a very Few of them wanted to stay in Ireland, most of them wanted to go, they wanted to leave this godforsaken land. And that was basically the idea behind it. If they did work, and they could work, by that stage after the famine, higher wages had to be paid because there were fewer workers. Higher wages meant they could save and find the fare quicker, and they did. And they took, as I say, advantage of all the schemes. So. Their migration pattern rose and there would be more of them leaving after the famine than before. Now finally, um, in this category, we have the cottiers. <coughs> now, 
The cottiers were those landless labourers who basically worked for farmers in return for somewhere to stay on a small plot of ground to grow their own uh, supplies. These were the most vulnerable people of all and these were the ones most affected by the famine. Before the famine, they didn't move. They stayed where they were, they were quite happy on the land and they didn't need much. These people were mainly Catholics they didn't go for primogeniture, which means that, uh, even today, quite often, the property would pass to the eldest son. In their society, what happened was the land was divided between all the sons equally. So basically, you could have a good, strong farm, but within one generation, if you had seven, eight, nine kids, it could easily be disseminated into several small plots. Now, Having said that, it didn't take a very big plot. I believe that a quarter of an acre was enough to grow enough potatoes to uh, sustain a family of six for a year, allowing for the meal months between August and September, the hungry months as they were known. Um, because of that, most of these people married young. They had large families. They were able to subsist. The potato could grow on quite poor land, so you can see the land creeping up up the mountains out to the bog, but the potato grew there so it didn't matter and they were quite happy. Unfortunately, when their main food source failed, very quickly they found they had nothing left to sell, nothing, no more resources, basically nothing to do. Um, and the only options open to them were to stay in the land and starve, go to the workhouse and probably die of disease, or take up an offer from one of the landlords or agents or charities to emigrate. And these were the class of mostly, there are about a million of these people migrated in the years just after the famine. Um, and many were in the infamous coffin ships, which were overcrowded, overpacked, not properly provisioned, and often died, um, either they died either at the dock, on the ship, in the holding centres, and some unfortunately even sent back home, which is even worse. You'll find that as a class, many of these people felt that they were forced off the land. Uh, but it was when these le people left, the average age of marriage went from 17 up to 28. This means that not everybody was married, but as a class, these people did marry young. Whereas the other classes, such as the strong farmers, the aristocracy and so on, left it in their 20s. Also, medium-sized farmers who wanted to wait until they had a farm of their own would put off getting married. So they, that would raise the age of marriage. They would wait until their parents died, and maybe their parents died and didn't die until they were in their 50s or something. So again, that changed the overall average of it. Um, after the famine, there wasn't the same tide of the land. They, you know, they'd given up again on this godforsaken land. Letters from America when they came back were saying how well people were doing. Not all of them, obviously, but quite a few. And enough to encourage people. But the people that did go in these coffin shops, when they got to the other side, often found it really hard there as well. But they had this idea in their head and they brought the myths and legends with them. And this is why you'll find things like, I'm sure we've all heard this, I'm trying to read out it. Oh Father dear, I often hear you speak of Erin's eye, her lofty scenes, her valleys green, her mountains rude and wild. They say it is a lovely place wherein a prince might dwell, oh why did you abandon it, the reason to me tell. O oh, son, I love my native land with energy and pride, till a blight can moor my crops, my sheep and cattle died. My rent and taxes were too high, I could not them redeem, and that's a cruel reason that I left old Skibbereen. Oh well do I remember the bleak December day, the landlord and the sheriff came to drive us all away. They set my roof on fire with cursed English spleen, and that's another reason why I left old Skibbereen. This is the sort of folk tales they bring with them, and while it did happen to a lot of people, as it was mainly 
this courier class, but that has been like an image that has remained with the Irish Americans to this day, that everybody was forced off their land and that it was a cruel image that did it. But as you can see, not everybody went and quite often a lot of them were very, very glad to go. Um, so the impact of the famine was that over one million people left Ireland permanently. The age of marriage went up from 17 to 28. The courtier class was eliminated. Very few of those left. In fact, as a practice, it died out entirely. And under the Poor Law Amendment Act of 1847, known as the Gregory Clause, anyone who held land of a quarter of an acre or more was not entitled to poor relief. Now that forced thousands of people, small farmers, off the land because they had no other means of subsistence. So they had no other option to give up the land and go to the workhouses. The workhouse system had been introduced in 1838 into Ireland despite protests. The people who had done the survey had said that the workhouse system would not suit Ireland, but they went ahead and did it anyway. So, the workhouse records, for which we have most of them, a few have got lost before they came to Prony, but the vast majority are here for Northern Ireland, and they come on to the BG reference. And you will find lots of things like comments, the workhouse is full, and police are stationed at the doors to keep the numerous applicants out. Therefore, no relief can be expected from that quarter. So that's um, one of the inspectors going around. And you will find that a lot of the workhouses that were built to hold maybe 400 people were holding over 1,000 during this period. And at one stage, the life expectancy in the workhouse over the family years was 48 hours. Now, that's not to say everybody died after 48 hours, but what I'm saying is there were times when it was so bad that you could either walk into the workhouse and probably because you were ill, hungry, disease, you die almost immediately. Others were left to die at the doors, to be truthful, so aren't actually entered in the statistics. And some people did eventually get out, but as you can imagine, rather scarred by the experience. Workhouse conditions were bad. People were split up by age and gender, and less eligibility was a standard. Now, less eligibility meant that the provisions in the workhouse should be lower than the average labouring family outside. Now, even the officials ex knew that that was difficult because what the average labourer outside the workhouse was getting, really, really hard to undercut that, really hard. And I'm going to show you some of the, um, these stats taken from various uh, um, reports into various Things. This, and I want to show you this one as well for a contrast. This is a poor house diet. This was held in Dublin, okay, and this was before the workhouse system was introduced. So this was a charity set up, and this was like the, oh, based on the rates, something similar, but the poor house for those people who couldn't afford to look after themselves had to go into the poor house. And you would find that on each day there was like not a very dairy diet, but at least it differed from day to day. Breakfast, you got either milk porridge, beef broth, or bread and beer. For dinner, you got peas, porridge, beef or mutton broth, rice milk, rice milk or hasty pudding, plum pudding, beef or mutton with broth, that was for your dinner. And for supper, you had bread and cheese. Might be a wee bit boring, but it was substantial nourishing. And if you notice, Nothing there about the potato. Nobody's eating potatoes here. This is all a different diet entirely. A <laughs> hundred years later, and the typical diet of the labouring poor, again carried out by the uh, inquiry into the poor in Ireland. Now, I've only shown a couple of things here just to give you a <coughs> glimpse, but they're all listed. Um, <coughs> men and women, the, di the diet differed slightly, but you'll see for breakfast, Four and a half pound of potatoes and a pint of milk. More potatoes, more milk, more milk, exactly the same. Dinner was the same, i.e. more potatoes. Uh, and in winter they sometimes have herrings and water instead of milk. Uh, sometimes they have herrings with dripping. Um, occasionally eggs and butter. 
But again, you can see that it's not very varied. It's, you know, you get the spots for breakfast, spots for lunch sort of thing. And then when supper, supper time, this meal is occasionally admitted. The same, but supper is not always eaten. <laughs> Uh, supper is only eaten at plentiful seasons of the year. So basically, they're having two meals a day, sometimes if they're lucky having a third, but it is based on the potato. So it's changed a lot in a hundred years. This is the workhouse diet. Five days a week, seven ounces of oatmeal, a quarter pint of milk, and for dinner, four pound of potatoes and a pint of buttermilk. Uh, or two pounds of potatoes in broth. Again, down to two meals, but you know they're not really making it that substantially worse because you couldn't, but it's still based on the potato. So, unfortunately when it failed they had to change it, I couldn't find this in tabular form, but it was recommended during the famine that inmates should receive not less than eight ounces of Indian meal, half a pint of milk, 14 ounces of bread and two pints of soup, which isn't too bad because if you're starving, that's quite a substantial, you know, thank you. So you can understand why people wanted this, poor as it was. Now, obviously during the famine years, there was a lot of relief work undertaken and that's a whole other lecture, but um, I just want to show you how the relief fell off quite dramatically after the famine years um, and then put them along. But there are tiny changes in it. As if you can notice, hang on, I'm going to see if my pointer works. Oh, no it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's that one. Ah, it is. This thin blue line is outdoor relief. Now outdoor relief was frowned upon initially. But there were so many people needing help and clamouring to get into workhouses that were already overcrowded that they did introduce it during the famine years. And you can just make out there that it's fallen until a baseline. And then it had to be reintroduced again during the agricultural crisis of the 1880s. Um, so the other forms of relief that mainly targeted on the workhouse again changed slightly. Able bodied people less likely there was always going to be that's the sort of purpley blue able-bodied children now again young children were abandoned or orphaned or whatever uh, and sometimes illegitimate children were thrown thrown into the workhouse so there's always going to be a number of those but even there that has seemed to be declining the sick seem to be keeping a pretty even key but Again, these were people who were too ill to work and quite often the workhouses, especially in the later years, started to function as hospitals. And then the other, this, other, you think, well, what other, but people who were too old to work, pregnant women, the mentally ill, people otherwise disabled, who couldn't actually work for themselves, ended up in the workhouse. Often for short periods, but as you can see, the relief was still needed throughout the entire century. But there were other forms of assistance. Excuse me. For those of you who can't make it out, that is a picture of a soup kitchen operated by the Quakers. And you will find that certain um, religions made soup and so on, and superism comes from there, because not all of it was entirely beneficial. But Believe it or not, there were landlords, members of the aristocracy and strong farmers who did help. There were private individuals, charities and government agencies. Now, apparently about 180 landlords and philanthropists it did offer some form of assistance. Uh, quite a lot of people actually did forgive rents and say, oh, we'll leave it until you're in a better position, so it wasn't too bad. But someone actively paid for people to go. And sometimes it wasn't even so much of paying their passage, but um, the shipping rules at the time meant if you wanted to emigrate, you had to have enough clothes for the journey, you had to have enough supplies for the journey. They weren't. So um, someone would give you those to help you to migrate if you had the ticket 
didn't matter if you had to take it, you still had to have all the other preferred, preferred paraphernalia that goes with it, sorry. Anyway, uh, the top 10 people who assisted immigration were, and this is just in alphabetical order, so not actually in order of people, were Bath, Dubisky, Fitzwilliam, Gore, Booth, Lansdowne, Mahon, Palmerston, Spate, Wandsworth and Wyndham. And between them, they sent out some 30,000 people. Not always uh, appreciated, but quite often, believe it or not, lots of people did write back thanking the landlords for assisting them to migrate. So, not all painted with a black brush, as I say. This, unfortunately, is another report from like three, um, again, 48, he said. In my last year's report, I had the painful task of recording a, per a period of great trial and difficulty for your tenantry here. To many small farmers, it was so ruinous that they abandoned their lands and immigrated to America in the spring of 1848. It is very sad to write that it was the very smallest number of those who, who so went away that succeeded. Some, from Ballymacaldrick, were in the unfortunate Exmouth, which was driven by a storm on the rocky coast of one of the Scottish Isles, went to the bottom, within grasp of land, and left not one passenger of hundreds to tell the tale. Others, chiefly from Drum Crow, after landing safely in America, were seized with a fever, which raged there in an unprecedented manner and perished ere they found a home. Some, while they lay exhausted with sickness, were robbed of the scanty supply necessary to enable them to settle and had to struggle back to Ireland. So you can see that the migratory trail was not a, always a good one for an awful lot of people. And these are very rarely counted in the statistics. So you are missing people from them. Um, a lot of, I suppose you can't do gooders, uh, also tried to help. And one of the, well, there's several of us, James Took, there's, um, sorry, I have names but the, Henry Fear Foster is a hero of mine. He's one of the ones who was very, very active in promoting immigration and put his money where his mouth is. He went to America himself to see what conditions were like for migrants. And due to his uh, misadventures, the rules on shipping were changed for the better. But he also wrote things like the Penny, the Penny Immigrant's Guide and Working Wages. And I just love this because of the imagery they use. And as you can see, this is the cottier leaving a poor cottage with this you know, broken fence and the pig outside the door and very little possessions. And this is the same immigrant, obviously after he's migrated to America, living in the lap of luxury, you know, with the maid bringing in the tea. So you didn't need to be able to read to get the message that, that was sending. And a lot of, after the famine, there was a lot of this message is being sent. It, the message was, go west, young man, you know, get out of this place go and find your fortune elsewhere, being reinforced by those who had made it and made it good. And obviously those who hadn't made it, well, dead men tell no tales. So um, this was another incentive for people to leave post-famine. Charities were another supplier, particularly abandoned children. Uh, Dr. Bernardo's home, for example, uh, sent out, this is, uh, I think, 1821, Sorry, uh, sorry, 19, this is in the 1910s, I think. Sorry, I beg your pardon. But they, by that stage, they had sent over 20,000 children to Canada yeah, as a result of the poverty in Ireland. Government agencies, now this, when I say government agencies, this wasn't just the British government, the Irish government, anything like that. These were the governments of America and Canada and even Australia who were pleading with people to come out for they believed that the land was over underpopulated, they needed more labourers, they needed more farmers, they needed more domestic servants. So they would take out advertisements in the paper, entice people to come, and you get things like the province of Nova Scotia is now settling. And here it may suit to embrace the present opportunity of removing to this fertile country, where each head of family on arrival will be put into possession and have a deed forever of 100 acres for themselves and 50 acres for each child and servant, and indented servants will also entitle to 50 acres at the end of their servitude. 
and that's free of all rent for 10 years. And where they will be free of all tithes, which are very unpopular, and have their civil and religious liberties fully secured. You can imagine to a small farmer struggling at home, that must have sounded like the promised land indeed, a real heaven sent opportunity. So these were the people trying to entice people from Ireland as well. Now, I, um, I could go on, but I've gone on long enough. So I'm just going to tell you some of the sources that are available for finding out more about immigration, the famine, and etc. Uh, workhouse sources for immigration now, DIPAM is a brilliant source. This is the database that's documenting Ireland, Parliament, people, and migration. It was set up in collaboration with the Queen's University and the Mallon Centre for Migration Studies in Oma and Prony. Um, they worked, staff from the Mallon Centre worked in Prony for several years, going through all the immigration letters, journals, diaries, etc. that we had. They have transcribed them and put them on this database, making it easy for you to read. But they've also gone to the other sources as well. So you'll maybe find things from the Lynn Hall Library, from Queen's, etc, etc. So it's one of your first, I would say, the first place to go to. Uh, that's the website, that's how it looks, www.dippam.ac.uk. It gives you all sorts of selections of what you can look for, such as newspaper reports, letters, Hansard, folklore, family papers, newspapers, etc. And it highlights your search term. And as I say, it is nicely transcribed and it gives you a reference number of the document and where it's held so that you can actually go and see the original suit you choose to do so in case you have any queries. Obviously, you're also more than welcome to come to the Public Record Office. But again, I would stress that doing a bit of research beforehand by going onto our website. And if you go to our search the catalogue, if you click on that, it brings you up a very easy to use thing where you just, if you type in immigration, uh, any text, that's all you really need to do. It will bring you up everything we have relating to immigration. Uh, in this case, 877 different types of records. Um, again, you would just click on one of them to see what you've got. And we very kindly put in the word immigration highlighted so that you can actually see what you've looked for. So a very, very, very useful resource. Again, the reference number is given, so if you're coming to Crony afterwards, you can look at the re bring the reference number with you. It'll speed up your time here. And finally, I think this is quite ironic. I'm sure we all know it. It's called The Irish Immigrants Lament, and it was written by a member of the aristocracy, who was, as you know, least affected. So it says, I'm bidding you along farewell, my Mary, kind and true, but I'll not forget you, darling, in the land I'm going to. They say there's bread and work for all, and the sun shines always there. But I'll not forget old Ireland, where 50 times is fair. So, basically, that's my talk finished, concluded. Thank you very much. And I